Thanks, Walter and Mario, for the invitation, actually. And uh, to be more precise, I'm telling you a not so short history of using R. Um, I called it in um, research and tech companies. And of course, it's about my very personal history. Yeah? So I start just with that. Yeah? Um, I graduated from school in 2000. And I came from a very small village uh, somewhere in the hills of Styria, right? And you had only two choices there. Yeah? One was you could go into uh, informatics and software development. The other one is you could go to the music uh, part of this. I choose music. We had a lot of fantastic software developers coming from the school. I couldn't code. Right? With music, I was good, but I wasn't that good, so uh, I needed a third option. Right? So what do you do if you don't know what to do? You study business administration, right? <laughs> I ended up, I ended up uh, environmental science. Um, and then uh, somehow uh, there was this magic moment where you apply for an internship at the bank, right? And um, they accept you. And one week later, you get another very boring offer from a research company, namely driving around and making hundreds of interviews and then writing them down. I chose the second one because it was paid, paid a little bit better. So finally, I joined the um, IT company of a bank only 10 years after that. But uh, this research, research company was really the reason why I started working with R. Back then, it was really very early, 2006, 7 There were some um, climate research si researchers working with it. And there were also uh, some statisticians working with it. And so I came into this R mode. Yeah? And this is now my story of R. Um, and it's going well beyond my uh, current uh, job in, in the George ecosystem. So um, you don't need to write, take any minutes or notes. Uh, you can find all of the presentation and also some samples on GitHub. And if you want to get in contact with me, this is my LinkedIn profile. So this is me from a data science perspective. You can see um, I'm this works. Very nice. Strongest in visualization. Yeah. Uh, but in the end of the day, in the last one or two years, I focus more and more, unfortunately, of giving presentations and um, uh, with caring about data governance and stuff like this, right? Um, or relationship to the data engineers. But luckily, um, I have a great team, and uh, they are stronger in other, in other areas. Yeah. Uh, from a programming perspective, um, I was mostly on R. Um, this year, I uh, did some experiments with JavaScript. I just like D3 and then similar stuff. But this talk is mostly about R, no worries. And if you want to reproduce that, by the way, or do a self-assessment, you just go again to this shiny app. Uh, this is not doing what I want to do. OK. Here. Need to reload it. And yeah, as it's reloaded now, it doesn't show my profile. You can import your profile if you saved it. So it's also great if you have a team of data scientists, everyone can do it. And you see, you change some parameters, ask some questions, trees. Oh, very bad. A little bit better regression models. Yeah. <laughs> Deep learning. Yeah, I worked in some projects, but never actively. So you can see this is really nice to see and the, the chart changes. And it helps you also to define a training strategy, right? So you might also know this one. Uh, I think I've worked in most of these areas, actually, of the data science pyramid of needs, uh, mostly in the middle layer, analytics, uh, also AP testing, uh, also being part of some, some AI projects. And I want to mention them at the at the very end of this talk, and all the stuff down there. Right? And as you know, the, this, pyram this pyramid was designed in a way to say, OK, the majority of a data science organization really uh, affects what data scientists are doing. Yeah? In most of the organizations at the beginning, they're doing everything like this. Yeah? They're talking to developers for tracking. They are um, talking uh, to engineers of uh, putting data from A to B. They're doing it themselves. They're manipulating data, and then they are building models. Yeah. And so this was published uh, actually in, in this sense that most of the data scientists are also good in a lot of, lot of other stuff. But let's start again with art. You know that I played music. 
but I was extremely bad in drawing. And so R helped me really to overcome this a little bit because I could do it in a more automated way. This is produced with R like 10 years ago, and it's nothing else than some random algorithms, right? Um, one is determining how many edges the polygon has, another one is saying where the red turns into green, another one is choosing from some of the countries uh, I've been to at this time point. Uh, so random algorithms, you can just re uh, re reuse the code and, and try it yourself and manipulate it and add to it. This is the last R code I will show today because I think there are many people and many use cases. And I think the focus here is now of this talk is really to talk you through these use cases. And yeah, you can see there are, above there are some um, parameters defined and then you can see the polygons uh, being, being done in endless for loops. Do you notice know what does it remind you about? Anyone, any, any association? Lichtenstein is good. There's one guy who is even better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Piemonte, um, an artist who paints basically in these three colors and uh, paintings like this. Yeah. Um, back then, I was in a museum in London, so I just uh, visualized one of his paintings, again, with a random algorithm. So here you can see the principle. This is one of it. These are 12 of it. Here, I just changed the parameters a little bit to be a little bit more red and blue and yellow. And again, like this, you can see it. Um, it's published since a lot of years on Shiny Apps. So you can uh, just look at it. Everyone knows what Shiny Apps are? Good. OK, so we see some of, the, some of them even today. Yeah. And I think it has been closed by Mario before. Sorry. But anyway, <laughs> too much art, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can try to reproduce it uh, later. The link is here. So this is just to show how shiny apps are usually done, right? But um, as you know them, I will skip this step. Um, and I would like to now go from art into risk. So this represents basically some of the research I did, yeah. Almost 10 years ago, um, I did the PhD and it was about tourism demand. And uh, actually, I wanted to combine uh, weather data with economic data. If you've been at the last hour meetup in, in November, um, you've seen a lot of the statistics on weather. Yeah? And we just went one step further in a way that we also used a lot of economic data and we tried to find patterns in economic data based on weather. And here's just a combi uh, definition of risk, right? It's the combi a combination of the probability of an event, how severe is something, and its potential impact, or how likely is something and its potential impact. And yeah, maybe uh, in insurance it's defined different, I don't, I don't know, but <laughs> um, we focused a lot on non-catastrophic risks, which means uh, bad weather or impact on tourism or, or something like this. Well, usually in insurance, you have catastrophic risks, which would be, let's say, an earthquake or like uh, flood damage or something like this. So basically, this is just um, the concept. It's you see some distribution of a weather index, and you immediately need to start thinking about is it changing? Yeah, uh, we debate a lot about it in the public at the moment, right? But also, you can see it in trends in the data. So is this distribution changing over time? The other thing is. Is normal, normal distribution always the best one? We know that for us, a lot of indexes, is, it's not, right? And so this is one part of the story. The second one is the relationship. So here you see a very linear relationship, and what is called sensitivity is basically um, the relationship between some economic or business indicator and some weather index. Yeah, it can be temperature, can be some derived index like heating degree days or uh, snow uh, days with snow cover, whatever. Again, the sensitivity can change over time. And again, usually mostly the linear models are not the best ones to describe it. And so the concept of weather risk was basically introduced back then uh, to this problem. And we said uh, there is something called a weather value at risk. It means with a 5% probability, what is the damage? 
If you think about the skiing industry, what is in, let's say, one out of 20, 20 years, the outcome of a, of a bad winter. And as we will see later, um, a bad winter can, um, can be defined different for, the, for different stakeholders. I don't want to skip in or go in too much. You can read my PhD thesis if you really have a lot of time. Uh, it's also shared on GitHub. And um, this is just one of the passions I developed back then when I wrote the thesis, it's spatial plots. And uh, our made it possible for me and my colleagues to just produce spatial, spatial plots in four loops, yeah, a lot of interesting things. And here you can see, for example, um, the old ski areas in Austria, and you see uh, the altitude ranges. So the dark colors represent higher altitudes, and the uh, light colors are low -lying, low lying areas, so you see already some patterns in that. So on the right side, next to Vienna, more low lying skiing areas. If you go to the Rhone, especially in the, in the uh, border to South Tyrol, it's very, um, very dark the colors. And now you can look at other indicators. This is the trend in overnight states, but be aware it's very old data because it's from a PhD thesis actually. So you can see um, there was a trend in Eastern Austria that uh, overnight stays decreased over this time. And in Tyrol and Salzburg, it increased. This had also to do with economics of scale effects and stuff like this. And so this was the third one. This is not a weather data. This is days with snow depth. That means where the snow cover is. And they can talk about a lot of uh, indicators. Again, the same patterns in the low alt altitude areas, less snow. Um, and so this is the output of it. Uh, Actually, very quick to talk in four minutes about four years of work. But, um, it's basically the sensitivity of overnight stays in Austria. And you can see that in the uh, lower lying areas, the sensitivity was determined to be higher. In the uh, higher lying areas, uh, it was less. This was determined on weather data. The effect could also go in the one or the other direction. That means there are some ski areas in high lying altitudes where mo more snow is not always the best thing. Yeah. And also, a lot of other research showed that the sensitivity was decreasing. We made it attributable to artificial, snow, artificial snowmaking. And here is the reverse plot for it. Uh, it's focused now on economic impact. That means if you have a community with millions of overnight stays, of course, the impact, even if the sensitivity is quite low per guest, um, uh, the relative sensitivity is low, um, the total impact is quite high. So you can see here the regions around, uh, for example, Kitzbühel. Here, here, or oh, like also like this, the massive master in industry in the terrible. I would like to focus on another research use case I liked very much. It's about electricity. And you can see in all of the research projects we were involved, I was basically the main horse, main workhorse for everything. Um, this is from some publication also I did with some colleagues uh, right after my PhD thesis. And um, it's nicely showing that the relationship between uh, the electricity load, um, this has been cleaned before, uh, that means for example public holidays and stuff like this, and the temperature in Austria. Uh, this is just one model, it's a smooth transition regression model. And yeah, you can see the relationship. You can also see, like here, if you want, you want to, to, to see some impact also if it's getting hot in summer and 25 degrees is the daily average temperature. So this can mean that uh, it's 35 degrees also during the day, right? It's, it's really increasing again. Yeah. So we, I think there are much more uh, up-to-date studies on that. And, uh, I haven't read the whole literature since then, um, but so the, the, the work we did was always the same. You have some climate research models, you have some output from that, right? Uh, and then the work begins. Um, in this case, we had temperature data on a one kilometer times one kilometer scale. We had um, population distribution data also on this scale, and we calculated some weighted indexes because we thought uh, it's really dependent for large European countries where the people are living. Um, so in the end of the day, this is the output for Austria. Uh, in this case, for, for models, it was cl very clear that 
the predominant effect on electricity load. And electricity, as you know, is just one small part of heating energy demand. The signs are really clearly negative. That means you save a lot of energy in winter. I am not the one saying, because of this effect, we shouldn't stop climate change. But in the debate, this was a contribution where we just really looked on all the countries. And we found something which was contradicting back then to other publications. Maybe we could see it with the current sensitivity. And it's important that cooling, of course, is getting more and more relevant in many countries. So the sensitivity changes. And maybe it has changed a lot in the last eight years. But what you could see is basically that, except Italy back then for this data, all the countries had a negative effect. The reason is, of course, in many southern countries, also Spain, France, they are heating also a lot with electricity. Because you need less heating energy demand. And that's why, of course, this is better than having some pellets or some other technologies with higher investments. This was use case two out of 10. But the other ones are getting shorter, I hope so. This is some work. There's a company called Uranium Research. I also worked for them. This was more applied stuff on this. And I asked them for examples, what to show at an R meetup in 2020. And this is, for example, a lifestyle check. So here again is the URL. You can try it out for your lifestyle. Big companies are basically using the service to check the lifestyle of the employees. And what is interesting for you as R users, this is basically all done in Shiny, the UI. Charts has JavaScript, but the whole backend again is in R. And they use this to connect R and JavaScript. Seems to work. Seems to work. I've tried it out. And yeah, these are just the other libraries they use, frameworks. And yeah, so it's a very nice application where R is doing basically the backend. Not something you see somewhere around in testing environments, but really in production. This is another service. We started to develop it back then. We called it Weather Driven Demand Analysis. And what it does is you have, for example, let's say a swimming pool. In summer, you need up to 40 people there, like waiters for the entrance, for the security of the people. And so for you, it's quite important to predict how many people you will need based on weather. And this relationship is usually not a very simple one, because a lot of other factors than weather play a role. Seasonal cycles, weekend effects, and stuff like this. So what this model is doing is basically it's taking your data from previous demand. It's correlating it with the data from sun, training a model. And you just get one forecast for the next week every day or so, or just go to this platform as a customer. So this is usually in the leisure industry. And it's also a nice example, because the whole backend is written in Python, to my knowledge. So performance. Uh, in my personal history, I um, yeah, left research and joined the tech company. It was a software, small software renderer from Graz, uh, but they had an American uh, owner. And yeah, I worked as a, a, in the product management department, so for a few years I had no exposure to R. But then yeah, we had this really, really large customer. And I wanted to tell you the story about this last large customer and how R helped you. Um, we had the following problem. It was a little bit David against Goliath. Right? These plots are not made with R, but with PowerPoint. I told you PowerPoint is not my main tool, right? So <laughs> this is David, this is Goliath. Usually David is fast, right? But in this case, the services they developed were quite slow. And that meant um, there was a slot in core banking systems, and they had to meet this. So this bank had core banking systems all over the world, uh, 40 countries. And in each of these core banking systems, it was a 15-minute slot they had to reach. But the problem was the services were really slow. It took hours to run this, the, these jobs. And so they had a problem, because this large corporate was not so friendly anymore, and they wanted money back, yeah, a lot of money. 
And the problem was that the technicians here, they all wrote these jobs, right? And each of these jobs was working really smoothly. But when they were connected together in parallel especially, they didn't work at all. So what we did is basically, after a lot of heated discussions, uh, I started to zoom into the log data. Um, I closed myself into some room uh, for one week and wrote an R application for that, for just visualizing what these log services are doing. I know there are commercial tools for that, but back then we didn't have the time for that. And um, yeah, just wrote a very nice visualization engine. It's not here, I don't have the code or anything like this. I just wanted to tell you this story because this is what I, yeah, I think the best thing about R is its flexibility. We all agree on that. Um, so in the end of the day, the problem was solved. The David got fast in this sense and uh, all the, the, the customer was happy. And also I moved on in my career and went to George. It's not that I invented George or something like this. George was already a product for some while, and there were some clever guys who have, uh, made this up, right? Um, and then it was rolled out. And I joined it again uh, as a requirements engineer. And finally, they had a problem. The big problem was in a bank, it's usually very complex how the whole things are structured, right? And the data department was just somewhere completely on the other side of the bank. And so it was for them, it was really taking them three weeks to get simple questions answered. And the reason, uh, and that was the reason when we jumped in into, into some um, data analysis using just R, very low level, and provided them with some, with some services. Five years later, we are at more than five million users over the whole of Europe. Um, to be more specific, we have rolled it out in four countries, Austria, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Romania. And we are going live next year in Croatia and in Hungary. So just a little Im animation. I hope you can start it now here. Oh, yeah. So this is what we are doing, right? We are counting 1 million users in two years and 3 million users after 3.5 years and one year more year for 2 million other users and we are still counting. And Coming again. So for those who don't know what George is, <laughs> this is one of the definitions. It will transform banking with digital George-ness. This should be some written joke. In other words, it combines the design, technology, and personality, a strong thing, right, into a comprehensive digital banking experience. And it simplifies your very personal financial life. The only question is, what has, it, has does this to do with R? Well, it was at the very beginning the first flexible workhorse for evaluating the user experience in the web and app version. Um, I will come later to the technological developments since then. So there were classically activation funnels, some feature acceptance, um, uh, tests that means like seeing uh, how the feature is behaving like in, in the traditional system, in the new system. Think about the, the search, for example, in George. Um, we have reinvented it completely. We use Elastic Search technology for that, and we could monitor um, how many more people were using it after uh, migrating it back basically from, from the other technology. So all of this stuff, I'm also very happy that uh, one of my first uh, colleagues in the data team is also here, Patrick, yeah, um, the, who also moved on in his career to other uh, teams, but yeah, he was actually the first hire I did. Um, because um, obviously, um, the more the product is growing, the more you need to think how to make great technology. So in the early times, like three years ago, even, it was a very clear tech stack. It was R, and it was our Oracle to connect to Oracle databases. Um, and there is, of course, a lot of security tech and stuff like this behind, but this is just uh, simplifying it now. So from our journey, uh, you have, um, we started with Python, yeah, let's say, at the, big, at the middle of this journey of these five years. And in the, mid, in the meantime, Python is as important as R. I will show you now some uh, comparison of use cases, what we are doing with, with R and what with Python. And also some uh, big data technology uh, requires, of course, to get better with Spark 
not me personally, as you've seen on the right radar, but for <laughs> some others. And also we did sort of the migration from uh, Oracle only into also using the Elasticsearch stack for, for log analysis and also for self-service dashboards with Kibana. So um, ELK stands for Elastic, as the, basically the, back, uh, the, the, the storage um, or the distributed storage system, Logstash, which ships in data, and Kibana, which is the visualization tool. Yeah. I think a tech stack you see quite often in, 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 um, yeah, in, in, in tech companies. And this elephant here is uh, Hadoop, the Hadoop ecosystem, Cladera. In this case, is the render is the only one left, obviously. Um, and so for selected use cases, we are using the, this platform. Uh, so uh, basically, as a data scientist, you still use R and Python, um, but yeah, in a, in a different context, and you need to know a lot about technology, so it's not that easy. Good. Talking about applications. How is it with time? Like, uh, still some time left? Or? Good. Um, as I mentioned before, we had the first reporting backend uh, done in R. Um, we migrated, luckily, some of the stuff over to some standard reporting systems and stuff like this. So this um, has been so somewhat decommissioned. We use it now for ad hoc reports. That means uh, uh, explorative analysis uh, and, and stuff like this. Also, we have um, experiments with some liquidity forecasting with, with R. Um, yeah, we had a very nice uh, idea from a, from a vendor. Uh, and, yeah. and the last but not least, there is one technology I would like to talk to a little bit more. It's Flex dashboards. Uh, I will show it in a minute, but I want just to finish with Python before. Again, Python ad hoc reports. Then buy Spark if it goes into, into larger data sets. And A-B testing if you think about um, yeah, evaluating uh, simple tests if like one or, part, more, or two buttons are more effective. Yeah. And last but not least, uh, the knowledge repo. Um, I will also introduce it in a minute because I think it's also a very nice idea. Especially if you have like a, a data team and then you have a wider project team and you would like to share between these two. These two. So this is now copied from the GG, uh, from the from the um, Flex dashboard website. So this is basically the principle of Flex dashboard. It's just like producing your dashboards with R. It's kind of easy. It's like intuitive. You know about it. Like uh, our HTML pages are usually also structured. You can do that. Yeah, that's no problem. You can use whatever is the the the, the uh, plotting method you prefer. Here in this case, it's ggplot. But uh, I want to give you a demo also on how you can use it more interactively. So again, here we are shifting now to a demo application. So, so the basic principle here is again shiny combined with Flex dashboard. This is just an open platform to to, to publish. Um, Shiny dashboards, I think you know it. Uh, it's like shinyapps.io. And here you can see the interactivity, right? The plots. Or the usual interactivity you know from um, Shiny. Good. Um, so this was Flex dashboard as an alternative to say, other BI solutions, whatever, commercial BI solutions, um, like in a startup style, uh, reporting uh, of things. This is the Airbnb version of a knowledge repo. So it's published on GitHub. Um, and it's very easy to integrate if you know Python. So for me, it's hard. Um, and actually, what it does is you can either an R or, or Python write your own notebooks. right? But then the question is, how do you publish it? Slack, email, talk people through, yeah, whatever. Ask to you connect, whatever is your favorite thing. Yeah. Uh, with this knowledge repo, it's basically that's like a blog yeah, it's from your data team. And you can just upload it. In our case, we'll upload it to an internal GitHub ver version. Uh, you add some tags, 
and uh, yeah so those people who prefer Python can work in Python those people who prefer R can work in R and yeah you use it sort of as a, as a knowledge repo so now I come to my last use case yeah and we call it power up power up is a concept um, it started with uh, simple plugins in George um, but we really want the community uh, other companies to team up with George. There's a good reason for that. And I mean, you can read it also on our homepage. Um, we think there are fantastic services out there on the market. And you have the vision for the service, or you have already a successful service somewhere on another market. And we have one other thing with the platforms. Yeah, we have 5 million customers in four countries. And so um, here it is about building partnerships. There's just one, one big problem. We would never share our financial data with you, or better the data of our customers with you. And data privacy really also restrict this sharing of data. That's a problem, because if you want to understand our data and our data structure, yeah, how can we proceed? And this is a very nice idea, and I think you've heard it at other meetup groups. Uh, um, so this is basically a service uh, developed by mostly AI. Yeah? So we were a prominent part of this of this story, and so basically, uh, it's all about um, synthetic data, which is not uh, anonymization in a classical sense, but it's just using really big, big um, generative neural networks um, to, to to produce it. And we, my team, was basically evaluating this approach from a how, how well it fits, and it was really, we were really surprised uh, on the output. It was so, um, it was keeping a lot of the attributes actually, like correlations between uh, merchants, for example, um, the realistic distribution of amounts and stuff like this, but still, uh, you cannot trace back a single person. If you want to know more about this use case and how it is working, either you talk to the guys from Mostly, I think they have developed their deck stack a lot actually in the last year, or uh, you can also go uh, and read this publication uh, I did together with Michi Platzer and uh, I also shared it on, on this uh, GitHub link. The R part of it, I'll just describe to you briefly. So you have two, um, two environments basically. One is the training environment. Uh, have it secured somewhere in, in your backend in this case. And so Python is doing the pre post and uh, post processing. And so you have the TensorFlow for the, for the uh, deep generative models. And then in our case, Shiny was used really for the quality assurance, like we built uh, dashboards which, which, shown, which have shown the, the difference between basically the real and the, and the synthetic data. And so the model was improved again based on this feedback. And uh, once you have trained the model, you can deploy it in, in some generator module. So here uh, we used an um, Python for the post processing and for the integration. And the, the smart story here is, of course, this generation module you can run everywhere, somewhere in your IT, you could run it on uh, somewhere in the cloud. It's, it's pretty simple, it's a Docker container, and, and you just take it, and there is no sensitive data in this, in this model. Yeah, so this is, was one of the really nice stories also where uh, both R and Python are used. And this brings me to my kind of summary. I hope you've seen that R can be used as the workhouse for many applications. Yeah. For some it's better suited, for others less, right? But uh, you can do everything with it. You have seen spatial and artistic plots. You have seen uh, the, uh, a possibility to connect it to databases for data retrieval. Self-developed backends for research applications. Interactive dashboards and talk analysis, e.g. with Shiny or uh, like with Flex dashboard, any kind of quality assurance reports, any kind of direct machine learning modeling, of course. And so many people debate this question um, how is it with R and Python, right? Like um, R is shrinking, Python is in increasing like hell, right? Which I think is not, not the case yet, yeah? but uh, the, the, the dynamics with Python is quite, quite uh, astonishing. And so I would say there is place for both of them. There is just different use cases which um, yeah, go, 
go more into one or the other direction. So my forecast is now, it's end of the year, right? We do predictions uh, that also in five years, both of these will be around for a lot of, lot of use cases. So again, the material is shared on, on GitHub. And uh, yeah, if you want to have, to have any discussions on any of the topics here, I know it's a lot, it was quite overwhelming, yeah. Uh, maybe you expected the, how is it called? Um, if you have a full band, right, in German. Uh, but yeah, if you want to discuss this in more detail, uh, just please write me on LinkedIn or. And last but not least, uh, this is the obligatory we are hiring announcement. Um, <laughs> at the moment in the group, there are open senior data science positions, one in a very interesting area that's compliance. Uh, this is really a freaking uh, hot topic, I would say. Yeah. Uh, the other one is in the general data science team. Um, that's in a sister team, basically, or of, of our team. And uh, also George is hiring yeah, business analysts, designers, content developers, app developers, testers, whatever you can think about in a software company. Next year, and also, again, some data engineering resources. Uh, but this is not yet publicly available and announced. So if you have any questions on this uh, hiring or whatever, you can also just approach me or one of my colleagues, like Walter, he's also uh, in the ASTIC group. Okay. So have there be any questions uh, coming in via Slido? It's not a very interesting thing. Okay. So first of all, thank you. Thank you.